let's begin. Let's pray before we start. Uh, Lord God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for uh, this this passage that uh, that we're gonna. I mean, this this teaching that we're gonna go through today. God, uh, I ask you that first and foremost, may your Spirit um, help us to understand this. May it help us to realize it. Uh, may it help us to be able to uh, grow in our faith and have our faith be stronger. God, uh, may this not be just uh, head knowledge, but it may be. Uh, transformative to our hearts so that we might be able to trust in you more and have more confidence in your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So the first thing we're going to see is uh, just kind of like an overview of today, uh, overview of, of what we're going to discuss and three key questions. Oh, by the way, I have handouts for you guys back there. Cool. Got it. Pens. Awesome. Beautiful. Let's begin uh, by answering some of these questions. All right. So this is an overview of what we're going to discuss. So first of all, how does the Bible authenticate itself? How does the Bible, how, how can we say that the Bible is authentic? How do we know that it's, that it's real and it's the word of God? Okay. Now, we're also going to explore what evidence is there that the Bible is inspired. So we're going to look at different kinds of evidence. We're going to look at internal evidence. We're going to look at external evidence, evidence in the Bible and evidence outside of the Bible to prove that it was real. And is there any evidence for the historicity, meaning uh, historically? Can we find information outside of the Bible that can validate what the Bible says? Uh, so those are really what we're going to discuss. But before we do, I wanted to ask you guys a question. Are you guys seeing what I'm saying? Okay. Right. So question for you guys. Think about this for a moment, and then we'll discuss it. What makes you believe that the scriptures are inspired? How many of you guys? Okay, let's let's first, let's not make assumptions. How many of you guys believe that the scriptures are the inspired word of God? Like this is the word of God for you. You guys okay? Good. So the question is, what makes you believe that? Why do you believe that? It would be a huge coincidence, right? It would. I mean, think about this. All these different authors over. It's. We'll get to that. It's actually one of the one of the evidences. Over fifteen hundred years. Like I. I can't. I can't. I can't like coordinate with somebody fifteen hundred years from now, right? Like it's. It's pretty hard, and we're telling the same story. So yeah. So that's that's good. That's that's a great. That's a great evidence. Uh, anybody else? What, what? Why do you think the Bible is the inspired word of God? Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at prophecy, prophecy is a huge. Uh, evidence that the Bible is real, is and we'll look at some of those uh, some of those things that you're gonna that you talked about about how each one of those prophecies in, that pointed to Jesus is actually true, and uh, it's huge evidence. It's huge evidence. What about more like personal? Maybe you don't know any of these uh, um, different uh, evidences, but like personally, like what, what what? Why do you think the this is the word of God? Do you have any personal experience? Has this changed your life? Does this have the power to change your life? Yeah. How can, can you give me an example? So scientific evidence, you know, and then there's, you know, what you said is is very key because sometimes some of the things that this says, humanly thinking, it's like, oh, that's not gonna work, but then we do it, and it works, <laughs> right? It's like we we follow what the Word of God says, and it's like, wow, this did change my life. You know, I, I could I could attest to it personally that the gospel has changed my life. You know, there's different evidences in my life personally, like not even looking at this historical stuff. Personally, I have seen life transformation. I know who I was before I met Jesus, and the gospel has transformed my life, and I know who I am after Jesus. So there's definitely a subjective evidence, right? There's there's ev this is what we call subjective. It's it's uh, it's based on your experience. Like, I can't prove your experience, right? I can't physically or, or historically prove your experience. But I, I know it's yours, and I know it's true in your life. Now, I can research that in your life. I can, I can make sure that, hey, this is who you were before. I could interview people. I could ask people, right? Were they really like this? Was Gabe really like this before? Was Allison really like this before? And now I look at your life, and I see that, that it's different, and I can see evidence of that that was true and evidence that your life has changed, right? So there's definitely subjective evidence. And, uh, you know, sometimes we might think, com coming into something like this, we might think, okay, but why do we even need to go through some of this stuff? Why is it that we need to find proof of the Bible? And we're going to talk about different evidences. So there's, four, there's seven things that we're going to discuss 
first, I, I always messed up in this word, so uh, just uh, give me grace, okay? Self-attestation. I, I feel like so. I feel like so weird saying that. Well, that's one of the what's, that's one of the big ones. Okay, uh, we're gonna look at the uniqueness of the Bible. We're gonna look at the historicity, the historical facts of the Bible. Uh, we're gonna look at the prophetic elements. What you were talking about, CJ. We're gonna look at the testimony of Christ and how, honestly, that is where everything hinges on. Okay, uh, we're gonna look at the life-changing ability, the subjective, like how it could change our lives, and then finally the testimony of the Holy Spirit. But I want to read you a passage before. Uh, we dive in. Because sometimes we think, you know, you just have to believe. You know, you, you hear that a lot. You hear that in, in, in churches. You hear that in Christian circles. The Bible is the Word of God because it's the Word of God, and you just have to believe. You just have to have faith. And that's true. That, that, that is very true. Faith is the way that we can come to God. However, I want us to look at this passage here in uh, John 20. Um verse 24. You guys remember Thomas? Doubting Thomas. That's how we know him, right? Doubting Thomas. Why was he doubting Thomas? He just got a nickname. Why was he doubting Thomas? I'll believe it when I see it, right? And here's the, here's the thing about this passage. So context-wise, if you don't know the story, uh, so Thomas is one of the 12 disciples, walked with Jesus throughout all his ministry, saw him die, saw him on the cross, saw him buried into the grave, was there when they put the, well, I don't know if he was actually there, but when he saw that Jesus was put into a tomb, right? A Roman soldiers and everything. And now they're telling him, no, 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 Jesus is no longer dead. Jesus is now alive. He's resurrected. He's like, nah. <laughs> like what many of us think, right? There's no way. There's no way that somebody resurrected from the grave. There's no way that he is alive, living, and breathing. I'll, I'll believe it when I see it. And look at this passage here. It says this. It says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, by the way, we're in 2024. One of the 12 was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told them, we have seen the Lord. We saw him. Believe us. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my finger where the marks, sorry, put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side where he was pierced with a spear, I will not believe. Verse 26, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. The, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, you're going to hell for not believing. Is that what it says? No, no, it doesn't say that. He says, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord, my God. And Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And this goes to show us the human heart, right? It shows us how even though, even though it takes faith to believe in the resurrection, to believe in Jesus, to believe that the Bible is real, some people need evidence. Some people need evidence. Some people cannot believe as easily as others, right? God hasn't given them as much faith as other people to be able to believe without seeing evidence. And the truth is, God doesn't, Jesus doesn't condemn Thomas for doubting. He doesn't tell him you're going to hell because you doubted. No, what does he do? He says, you wanted proof? Let me show you proof. And here's, here's, here's the mindset that I want us to have for this. It's not that any of these things will be conclusive. I will not, we will not leave here tonight saying the Bible is real. The Bible is the inspired word of God without a shadow of a doubt. There's no doubt. There's no, um, I, I will prove everything correct. That's, we're not going to leave here thinking that way. It still requires faith. It still requires you to believe in what the word of God says. But hopefully through this, this, uh, this uh, teaching, we'll be able to understand better and have more proof. And if you already believe and if you trust without any of this evidence, awesome, you'll leave with your faith strengthened. And if you're kind of skeptical or maybe you're kind of doubting or maybe you're like in that in-between, hopefully this will help you have stronger faith in the word of God, all right? So just, just, just to, I just wanted to read you that passage so, so that you know 
that it's not like we're trying to, to change the gospel. We're really just trying to find evidence to help reinforce and strengthen our faith. So the first thing, which is really important for any book, for any document to prove that it is um, a divinely inspired document is self-attestation, okay? And what this means is that in and of itself, it says it's the word of God. So many Christ, uh, many um, religious books claim that they have divine authority, right? Like you look at the Quran. The Quran says it's the word of Allah. It's, it's Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad. It's, it's the words of Allah. You look at the Book of Mormon, right? And it attests that it is uh, John Smith who wrote this from a vision that he got from an angel, right? There's there's uh, there's different uh, ancient scriptures. There's all, all these different religious scripts that say they are uh, given by a divine inspiration. And here, we're going to see how the Bible also has this self-attestation, okay? A couple of passages talk about this, and it's, it's, it's said in many different ways. One of the ways is throughout a lot of the Old Testament, especially prophets, would say, thus saith the Lord. This is what God says. So in other words, these are not my words. The writers of these, these texts many times would say, these are not my words. These are the words of God. This is a message from God. This is a prophecy from God. This is a, a, condemn, a condemnation from God. These are the words of God. These are not my words, right? And so we see that throughout all of the Old Testament. A couple of key passages in the New Testament that we see is 2 Timothy 3.16. Okay? It, says, um, it says, for all scripture is God breathed, and it is useful for teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in righteousness so that the uh, servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we see that in that passage, it says that it is God breathed. It is the word of God. We see uh, 1 Corinthians 2.13. Let's turn to that one. Um, I don't have any of these passages up, by the way, so we're going to be using our Bible quite a bit. So I encourage you guys to open up your Bibles to these passages when I, when I tell you. So 1 Corinthians 2.13 says this. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. So in other words, Paul is writing here to the Corinthians. He's saying, I'm not teaching you my own wisdom. I'm not teaching you what I learned in seminary or in school. I'm teaching you the words of God that were revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. So it's attesting to its divinity, right? Uh, Hebrews 1, uh, it, it talks, uh, we don't have to turn to that one, but it says, in these days, God now speaks through his son. He has spoken to us in the past through the prophets, through his creation, and now he speaks to us through his son. It's attesting. Let's turn to 2 Peter 1. That one might be a little bit harder to find, but uh, if you know your like Bible song or if you have a Bible app, it's a lot easier to find. Uh, 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21 says this. It says, above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the Bible itself says, this is the word of God. It's self-attesting to its divine nature, okay? Um, but here's the problem. Any type of scripture, any type of religious book could claim that without actually showing proof. It's what we call circular reasoning, right? We believe the word of God is the word of God because it says it's the word of God. But how do you know it's the word? Because it says it's the word of God. But like, how do you, because it's, so you see how it's that circular reasoning, right? It's, it's not, I don't want to say that it's not proof. It is very big evidence, and a lot of people, just based on that, will believe and have faith. But it's not the only evidence that we have. And it is, but it is needed criteria. We do need the Bible to say it's the Word of God. Because if the Bible never claims for it that, that it is the Word of God, then we can't assume that it's the Word of God. But in many times, in many places, the Word of God says, this is the Word of God. All right, so moving on, 
The next part is uniqueness. Uniqueness. Now, here we're going to go into a little bit of statistics, okay? And uh, the reason why is because this is the most unique book in the entire history of the world, okay? It is, it is extremely unique, and there's a lot of things that make it unique. And we're going to go through a couple of these different things. So just to give you a context, the Bible is a collection of 66 different books. It's not one book. It's 66 different books. As a matter of fact, the reason we have books in general, like the fact that you have books is because of the Bible. The Bible was the first one to be created into what they call the codex. There were all these 66 different scrolls that they decided, hey, you know what? We need this in one volume, so let's create a codex, and let's put it all into a book. Let's bind it, and that's what they called the codex, right? There was different codex, Codex Vaticanus, a lot of different ones that, that they started with. But the reason you have books in the first place is because of the Bible, all right? Because people wanted to be able to read the Bibles. But it's not one book. It's 66 different books, right? And all these of these 66 different books, it's made up of different genres. You have poetry, you have narrative, you have prophecy, you have apocalyptic literature, you have all these different imageries in the Bible. And it's written by over 40 different authors, okay? Maybe less, maybe more, depending on who wrote, like the book of Hebrews, we don't know who wrote that. We don't know a, a couple of the authors in the Old Testament of, of those different books. Uh, but we know that is about 40 different authors who wrote the, the Bible. And it's not just like the religious leaders who wrote these things. It's a whole bunch of different kind of people, right? You have John. John was a fisherman. He wasn't, he wasn't like a scholar. I mean, eventually he learned how to write and all that stuff because that wasn't very common in that time. But you have a fisherman, you have a tax collector, you have shepherds, you have kings, you have uh, Solomon and all his wisdom. So the range of, of different kind of people who wrote this are completely varied. It's not like you had to be a scholar or a priest in order to write part of the Bible. It's written by different kinds of people. It's also on three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. We saw Scripture written in all three of those. The Middle East is, is part of Asia. And not only that, it's written over a span of 1,500 years, right? So this book, the, all of its writings was written over a span of 1,500 years. So that's a lot of time to try, like what you were saying, to try to get it all, to try to collude into writing uh, a, a scripture that was from God that took 1,500 years. Like, you can't plan something for that long, right? Um and all the writings uh, to different circumstances dealing with different issues. It has been translated into more languages than any other document, book, or writing. And because of that, because it's so prevalent, it's actually been um, attacked by so many people. Because of its claim for divine inspiration, its message, and its unparalleled popularity, the Bible has also been attacked more than any other piece of literature. So if you think that this book that you have here in front of you has not been attacked, has not been criticized, has not been condemned, have not, has not been uh, tried to be stopped by many different people, remember that this book was burned for many, the reason we don't have a lot of the older, um, um, what they call autographs, the first writings, is because people burned Bibles because they didn't want this message to go out. This book was persecuted just as much as the Christian faith was. But despite all these attacks, the Bible remains the authoritative book for more than 2 billion professing Christians, and it is the best-selling book of all time. So it's very unique in that sense. But that's not the only thing that makes it unique. It's also, it's historicity. There's a lot of things inside of this passage, inside of this, this book, that we can prove historically. I, I, I think sometimes for us to be able to to, how do I put this? In order for us to be able to deny the claims of the Bible, a lot of times we have to have a mindset that miracles aren't real, right? In order for you to, to look at the, the, the evidence of the Bible and to come to the conclusion that this could not have happened, you have to start off with a mindset that miracles can't happen. And that the only thing that can happen are the things that you can prove. But I want to give you an example. Uh, I know some of you guys, your dad's a lawyer, right? But I want you to think of a courtroom, okay? Let's, let's imagine that you guys are all a jury in a courtroom, right? And I present to you 
an event that you weren't there for? How can I prove to you that this event was real? I would need what? What, what, what? what kind of things would I need to prove to you that this event was real? Eyewitness accounts. What else? Evidence. Okay. Okay. Now, do sometimes eyewitness accounts lie? Can evidence be misleading? Okay. So not only do you have to have evidence, not only do you have to have eyewitness accounts, it all has to make sense, right? Because if the facts don't line up, if the evidence doesn't line up, if the witnesses are all um, are all saying the same story, if they're if it all if if they're all lying, then you could come to the wrong conclusion. So, in order for us to understand this, think of it as a trial. Okay, think of it as a um, we are putting the word of God under trial. Specifically, we're putting uh, the the, can, the, the inspiration of the Bible under trial. And I'm going to present evidence to you. But at the end of the day, it's up to you to decide whether or not this evidence is valid or if it's not, whether you agree with it or whether you do not. So I'm going to give you guys a couple of things about the historicity of the Bible. And there's two kinds of evidences that we see. So there's internal evidence, evidence within the Bible that prove that it's real. And we're going to spend a lot of time on historicity, by the way. So put it by it. Get ready. All right. And we're also going to look at external evidence. So evidence coming from outside of the scripture. Okay, so internal evidence, evidence inside, and external evidence, evidence outside of the scripture. By the way, you guys good? Are we guys following, tracking along? It's good for you? Okay, good. Um, so four key things in internal evidence. This is this is all in your in your packet, by the way. Uh, the first thing we're gonna look at is honesty. Second thing we're gonna look at is harmony. Uh, the third thing is we're gonna be looking at extraordinary claims, but not just extraordinary claims, provable extraordinary claims. And then D, the lack of motivation. What's the motive? If somebody made these stories up, what was the point? You know, in a, in a trial, you got to have what? You got to have motive, right? If there's no motive, you, why did somebody kill somebody else? Like, you got to have the motive. You got to explain the reasons why. So let's break these down. Let's start with honesty. So one of the funny things about the Bible is that it does not shy away from talking about the mistakes of its people. It doesn't stop talking about, it, it doesn't um, cut itself short by the, uh, like, okay, let, let, let me give you an example. If you guys were ever telling us, like you got in trouble, your mom heard uh, uh, it, something happened in your house, right, when you were growing up, and then your mom asked you, what happened? How did you guys tell the story? Very differently, right? How, so, sometimes, I have kids, so sometimes I'm like, I hear one story, and then I hear the other story, and I know that the real story is what? Somewhere in the middle, right? Like, my older daughter is like, oh, no, because she did this, and she did that, and she did this, and she did that, and it's like, okay, well, that sounds really bad. Like, wow, she's pretty evil, right? <laughs> like, that's not good. And then she, and then I hear her side of stories, like, well, the reason I did that was because she did this, and she did that, and she's like, uh, when we tell stories, do we try to make ourselves look good? Do we try to make other people look bad? So if the motivation was for, if the motivation of these authors was to make God look good or make themselves look good, would they write stories about their failures, about their sins, about their shortcomings? No, right? And yet we see that all throughout the Bible right? It paints, it, it, it never paints this glorious picture that you would expect from a legendary material. There are some of that, there is some of that in the Bible, okay? But it shows people in all of their worst moments. I'll give you an example. King David, right? King David was a shepherd, man after God's own heart. He's a, a great leader or a great king, but he failed morally, right? Like if I was David and I was a king and they were writing a history about me, I would probably say like, hey, let's leave that whole part out. Like the whole like murder, adultery thing. Let's just not include that part in there, right? Let's include all the good stuff. Actually, there is some books that, that, that have you guys ever read Chronicles? Maybe, no? Okay, have, you, have you guys ever read the book of Kings? King, first, second Kings, first, second Chronicles. Okay, you know that they're parallel accounts, right? So it's the same story 
in two different um, in, in two different depictions. If you look at the book of Kings, you see all of the moral failures of David. But the purpose of that was to record history. If you look at the book of Chronicles, you don't see any of the bad things that David did. David has looked at, if you only had Chronicles, you would never know all the bad things David did. Why? Because the point of the book of Chronicles was to paint in the, in the light the people of Judah in, in, in a positive light. And so there are some that, that are painted in that image, but you also see the recording of the bad things they did. I mean, look, look, look at all of the, the, the I, I think in, in, your, in yours, you have a list of some of the people that the, all the evil things that they did, right? Like uh, Abraham was, a, was a, he, he, he like tried to <laughs> give his wife to the king. Uh, like, okay, think about this. John, the apostle John, right? The last book of the Bible, Revelation, right? He writes it down. He's done. He records the greatest things like in heaven. This is where we get all of our imagery from what heaven's going to look like. And then at the end of the book of John, the man gets in front of an angel and he he starts bowing down and worshiping an angel. Like if I was John writing that part of that book, I would maybe not put that part in, right? Like the, the angel's like, what are you doing? Get up, stop worshiping me. Like you're not, I'm not Jesus. Like stop worshiping me. So that's, it records all of the failures of people. So this, this goes to show you that if you were going to make up a story, you wouldn't include all of the bad parts of yourself. You also wouldn't include a lot of things that are difficult to understand. There's a lot of passages in the Bible that are difficult to understand. If you were making it up, you would maybe kind of like smooth things over, try to make things easy to understand. But there are so many um, aspects of the Bible that the Trinity alone, right? Like maybe they wouldn't have, maybe, maybe if they didn't include all of these passages that refer to it, maybe it would be easier for us. But no, they include it. Why? Because it's something that deals with the tension in our mind, right? Uh, I, this, this guy, A.W. Pink, wrote this about the divine inspiration of Scripture. He says this, he says, a forged history, a, a, a made up history would have clothed friends with every virtue. You would have made yourself look so good, so awesome, and would not have ventured to mar the effect designed to be produced by uncovering the vices of its most distinguished personages. Here then is displayed the uniqueness of scripture history. Its characters are painted in the colors of truth and nature, but such characters were never sketched by a human pencil. Moses and the other writers must have written by divine inspiration. I mean, Moses records so many of his failures. He, he, he talks about Noah. He, great, he got saved, man. You know, the only righteous man in the world. He got drunk afterwards and he like passed out in his tent. Like, like there's, there's so much negative light portrayed in the people that are in the Bible that you just wouldn't make this up. Logically, it wouldn't make sense for you to make up this story. We, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going, okay? Uh, some more of honesty. The Bible also contains a lot of irrelevant details. Details that if you were making up the story, why would you give these details? They don't really make sense. Let's turn to John chapter 20, all right? John chapter 20. I want to read a couple of these. This is actually based on a, a, a book. Um, the book is Letters from a Skeptic, right? And he includes this as part of his, uh, uh, of his letters. Basically, it's him writing to his dad. His dad was a skeptic, and he wants to prove to his dad that the Bible is real. So he writes him all these different letters. But he uses this, this passage to kind of portray um, the irrelevant details. Look at John 20, verse 1 through 8. I think it might be in your in your handout, okay? Uh, I don't know if it's the same version, but it says, early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, like that's that's already like a lot of detail. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. Pause it for a second. So the author here is saying that the woman, Mary Magdalene, the, the lady who would not be looked good upon, the one who had demons taken out of her, she was the first one to see the resurrection. Now, it's it's important for you to understand that women in these days could not serve as witnesses. Their testimony would not be reliable. So if you were making this up, you would not use women. You would use men. Oh, Mary found them. Yeah, yeah, but let's just let's just say Peter and John found them first. Why? Because 
their testimony would be credible. But yet you see in every single gospel that the first people who found Jesus were women. And this, this, if you were making this story up, you wouldn't use women. Why? Because it wouldn't be credible unless you're just recounting what actually happened, unless you're telling the story legitimately, right? And so it, it, it says Mary Magdalene, so it keeps going. It says, went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple. And by the way, this is talking about John. He's, this is his humble way of, of uh, portraying himself. It says, the one Jesus loved and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, okay? But I, I love this part. But the other disciple outran Peter. Like, here's a little embellishment. Here's a little bit of making himself look good here. Like, but I kind of beat Peter to the, to the it's like, it's, he, it's himself, right? But, you know, we both ran to the tomb, but, you know, I, I, I outran Peter. I'm a lot faster than him, right? And it says, and, and it says, and reach the tomb first. He bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Like the, the placement of it, okay, what, what's, what's the point of this? Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. Now, I think in, in the other translation, it talks about how it had even been folded into its, like, like okay, that's irrelevant. Like, okay, Jesus folded his head garment before he left. Like, okay, he made his bet. Like, okay, you know what I mean? Like, what does that have to do with doctrine? If you're making this up, why would you include all of these irrelevant details? And the, the Bible is filled with them. Like, there's a passage where Paul is writing to Timothy, and he says, hey, Timothy, um, make sure that when you get over here, you bring me my scrolls, but also bring me my jacket, because it's getting kind of cold, and I, 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 need, I need something warm, so bring my, like, why would you include this? You know what I mean? Like, th if this was made up, you wouldn't include these irrelevant details. All right, there's uh, this guy, Gregory Boyd, part of his uh, letter, um, part of his book, Letters from a Skeptic, he, he says is the gospel presents a consistent portrait of who Jesus is and what he did, as well as the events which surrounded his life. If the four accounts were individually fabricated, where did this consistency come from? But there are also significant differences in each account showing the relative difference of their perspectives. If they are all fabricated together, the consistency would be greater than we find. In other words, what he's saying is there is so much consistency between one gospel writer and the other that this cannot be fake. You got to remember that these passages were not written in, um, these, these stories of Jesus were not first written down. They were later written down a few years after Jesus died, right? Mainly the stories of Jesus would be told just like this. They would be explained and they would be repeated back and it would be told again. It would be repeated back. And, and when you made sure you had it right and you understood it, then you would go and you would teach someone else. It was an oral culture. These guys would memorize all of these sayings of Jesus, right? And so in order for, it, it, sometimes you read some of the gospels and you think, well, that's not exactly what Luke said. And, and, and Matthew said it a little bit different. He flipped that, that thing. They, they allowed some variances because again, it was an oral culture. But within that 10 to, to, to that 10% that variance that you could have, 4 to 10% variance, the main parts of the gospel are still there. And we see that throughout. But also, if you guys wanted to lie to the cops, right? Like, let's say something happened, right? And we say, hey, all right, we don't want to get in trouble. We got to tell this other story. We got to make up a story. And we got to get all of our facts straight, right? And if we were all to talk to the cops... And every single one of our stories lined up exactly, the cops would know that we're all lying. Why? Because if you're gonna, if you all have the same exact story from the same exact point of view, and you're retelling the same thing as if you practice it, then you know it's a lie. It's like when you and your sibling got in trouble, it's like, we're not telling mom. All right, this is what happened, right? We did this, we did that, we did that, and that's the story, and we're sticking to it, right? If that would have been the case, then you would look at Matthew, 
You would look at, at Mark, you would look at, at, at Luke, and it would be the same exact story. But we don't see that. We see some variances. We see Matthew focuses on one aspect of Jesus. We see Mark focuses really on the resurrection. If you've ever read Mark, Mark is like, yeah, yeah, Jesus was born, yeah, now let's go into the crucifixion. Let's go, like, he gets to it super quick. Luke, who is a doctor and a historian, he's like, okay, let me make sure I get all these details right. Let me interview people. They are different perspectives. And so we see that if they were too different, we would know that it's probably not real. But if they were too similar, we would also know that they wouldn't be real. Um, let's look at harmony. All right, so despite the fact that scriptures are a collection of multiple compositions, so multiple people writing it, written by different authors, different personalities, purposes, cultural representations, writing in different genres on three different continents in three languages over a time span of 1,500 years, the Bible has remarkable consistency that evidence is one guiding author who superintended the writings. Sometimes when I'm preaching, um, I'll look at a verse, right? And when we have, when we look on, on Sundays, we look at a verse and then we use that text to preach on a specific subject, right? A specific passage. But that same passage is also referenced in another book, right? I look at Ephesians. Oh, well, let's reference that to Colossians. Oh, but wait, the Bible also writes about something, something about that in the book of Psalms. Oh, wait, and there's also prophecy about this in the book of Isaiah. Oh, and this all goes back to the book of Genesis when the fall and the... So there is no way that all of these authors would have written with such unity, with such cohesion, when, when uh, there is no contradiction as far as doctrinal issues. They all state the same thing. Peter says the same thing. Paul says the same thing. Matthew says the same thing. They all agree. And even in the Old Testament, Isaiah says the same thing. Ezekiel says the same Like, they're all based on the same principles. And so we see that you can't, you can't collude with other people for 1,500 years, not even for 10 years, right? You can't make this stuff up. But throughout the Bible, you see consistency. You see a specific attribute of God, and it's the same attribute from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It's the same God. It's the same. Uh, the pa let's, let's look at patience. We talked about that this weekend, right? We talked about God being patient in his wrath. And we see that in, in the book of Exodus. God is patient with his rest. We see that in the book of Leviticus. God is patient. Deuteronomy, God is patient. We see judges. God is patient. We see in uh, the prophecies, God is patient. We see in the Old in the New Testament, God is patient. We see in 2 Peter, God is patient. The same attribute of God, God is has his wrath. He's going to punish sin, but God is patient. He is gracious. He is merciful. We see that same thing throughout the entirety of the Bible. It does not differ. And also, Parallel accounts all contain the same basic stories with different details and differing perspectives. This harmony adds to the historical legitimacy of the gospel accounts. So we see that even though Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have different viewpoints and different um, goals, we see that they have the same basic details. All right. Testable extraordinary claims. Now, we're going to move a little bit faster. Okay, Testable extraordinary claims. What does this mean? So there's thousands of historical claims of extraordinary events, miracles. Okay, Things that, unless you don't believe in miracles, are historical, meaning there is evidence to these miracles actually happening. Extensive details of these events themselves. There are times, there's locations of occurrence, there's witnessing audience with the result that they are testable through the normal historical means of objectifying the past. Many other religious books, they'll tell you, oh yeah, an angel came to me and, uh, and he told me this and he did this miracle. Oh yeah, when did it happen? Oh, it happened in my house. Was anybody else there? No, it's there by myself. It's no alibi. Back to the, to the, to the there's no alibi. If you have no, nobody else could see it. You're the only one that saw it. You're the only proof. You're, you're the one witness that saw it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's not the way it works. The Bible, on the other hand, has many miracles that were done in public. As a matter of fact, when you look at the miracles of Jesus, everybody who wrote about Jesus didn't write and say, oh, Jesus 
didn't perform miracles. They said he was some sort of sorcerer. I don't know how he did his stuff. Maybe he was into witchcraft or something. But they never say Jesus didn't perform miracles. They attest to his miracles. They don't understand it. They attribute it to other things, but they never say Jesus didn't perform miracles. Why? Because it's evident, right? What does something extraordinary happen right now, right? Let's say right now uh, the whole sky lit up, right? And there was an angel that came into the playground. Let's just random, right? Angel, playground, we'd all freak out, right? Because in the Bible, everybody freaks out when we see an angel. But, 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 there's a whole bunch of us, right? We all saw it. Every single one of us has that evidence. And we can be witnesses to other people. Now, will other people believe us? Uh, maybe not, maybe. But does that change the fact that we are all witnesses? So you can't prove that the event actually didn't happen. You, 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 you can't prove that the event actually happened, but you can prove that there were witnesses and you have to trust in the reliability of witnesses. And all of these miracles, many that are in the, in the Bible, are proven by witnesses who saw the event. And not only saw, they recorded it down in history. They wrote it down. And so we may not believe the miracles, but we got to believe the people who saw the miracles right? Just like Thomas. He, I don't believe unless I see it. You're, you're never going to see the resurrection of Jesus, but you can only trust in the witnesses that saw it, right? Um, so there's a lot of witnesses. And then lastly, the, the lack of motivation for fabrication. So why, why make this up? You know, what's the motive? What's the purpose of you making this story up? If the scriptures are fabricated, there is no valid motivation for the writers of Scripture to record what they did. There's, there's no motivation. I mean, think about the New Testament. If the, the gospel writers, let's, let's take it, what did they gain by writing these stories down? Absolutely nothing. They died, right? They, their punishment was death. Like, they got killed for their faith. So I'm going to write something down just so that I get killed? That doesn't make any sense. I'm going, people might be willing to die for something they believe, but they're not willing to die for something they know is a lie. They, be, be, people don't, don't die for something that they know is not the truth. You might die for something you believe in and you, you think it's the truth, but if you know it's a lie, why would you die for it? Why would you try to make it such a big thing? But, the writing of these beliefs would have brought further rejection with nothing to gain but the fear of death at the hands of their enemies. It would be better for them to lie. At least they would have lived, right? They would have survived. But we see that throughout. What's the purpose of Isaiah? Have you guys ever read the book of Ezekiel? Like, it's a weird book. Like, what's the point of writing down all these prophecies? I think the, the I forget which, which prophet it is. I think it might have been Hosea. But it's like the guy, like God wanted him to lay on his side, like on one side for like years, and then to lay on his side for another couple of years just to show an illustration. Just to illustrate to the people the amount of years that they were going to suffer. It's like, Dude, why? Like, <laughs> why would you make me go through this, God? And then write about it on top of it. Like, what's the point? You know, just for, like, you think some of my illustrations are extreme. Like, God was like, hey, uh, so here's what I'm going to need you to do. For the next 10 years, I'm going to need you to lie on. Like, it's crazy. There's no motivation for these things to be written. Some of the, here's what I'll tell you. Most of these people who wrote in the Old Testament, especially, they didn't know what was coming. When Moses wrote about the serpent biting on the on the heel of the woman and the and his her seed crushing your head, he didn't know that was Jesus. He didn't. He knew that a Messiah would be maybe coming, but he didn't understand that that's what it meant. It wasn't, in, and nobody understood it. It wasn't until Jesus came. It's like, oh, it's Jesus, the seed of the woman. Sometimes we look at this perspective from from our perspective, from our vantage point, and we think like. Man, why didn't these people get it? But they didn't get it because they were not in the same place in history as we are. They didn't understand that Jesus was there to, to save them. All right. 
Now let's look at some external evidence, all right? So yes, the Bible, you can literarily analyze it and it tells you a lot of things that, hey, somebody writing this wouldn't, write, wouldn't make this up. But now let's look at outside evidence, evidence outside of the Bible that proves to us that the Bible is real. So the first thing is preservation. Uh, preservation is, uh, is, is actually a whole nother teaching that we'll probably do at another time, okay? Because like, key question, how do we know that the Bible that we have today is the same Bible that was written back then? It's a good question to ask. We, if we can prove today that it's inspired, that's great. But the original was inspired. How do we know that the one we have right now holding in our hands is actually the same one? How do we know it's the inspired? Well, that's that's actually, like I said, that's a whole nother teaching, um, a whole nother time. Uh, but I will give you the brief summary of it. Of it. So the Bible is the most well-attested book in all of ancient history, with more extant manuscripts in existence than any other work. There are over, um, I believe, 5,000 uh, manuscripts of the New Testament, okay? Now, we're going to focus on the New Testament for a little while, okay? So the New Testament is one of the most uh, attested. There's there's so many copies of the, orig of, of the original uh, Bible. There's so many uh, copies, ancient copies of that, that Bible than any other book in all of history. There is no other. The, the next one that compares is Homer's Iliad, which was to the Greeks, like their Bible. And there is a relatively short, small amount of copies. And the distance between when those copies were written and the original manuscripts are hundreds of years. The Bible has thousands of manuscripts and the time between them is only a few decades. And so we can, that's, that's one of the, what they call, um, I forgot the name of it. It's something like scriptural analysis. I'll, I'll get you guys a word at some point or it'll come to me as I'm talking. Um, so the uniqueness of its preservation is inherently tied to its self-authentication as the word of God. There is no book that has been the object of so much scrutiny, that means uh, studying, and passionate attack as scripture, yet it survives today as a best-selling book of all times. This alone gives attestation to its authenticity as God's word being protected by his providential hand. So in other words, this book has been so attacked, and yet there is so much evidence that this book is the actual inspired word of God. What kind of evidence? Well, there's actual manuscripts. There's actual um, copies of it. It's widely spread. It's gone through different continents. And even when people think that, hey, maybe that, you know, that one was made up after the fact, then they find new evidence like, oh, we just found a whole bunch of new scripture uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls that prove everything else was right. You know, so it is it is affir affirmed by its preservation. It's a, it's one of the most well-preserved uh, books in all. Well, it's not one. It is the most well-preserved book in all of history. OK, we have nothing that compares to its preservation. Archaeology. Now, this is key because the witness of archaeology has continually confirmed scriptural data. So archaeology is the science of digging up old junk that is preserved, right? So they go into the ground, they dig it up, they find, hey, look, a coin. Hey, look, a potter, a piece of pottery. Hey, look, uh, an inscription. Hey, look, a piece of paper. Hey, look, there's information, uh, whatever, cities, buried, like old ancient cities. And the more archaeologists have studied the more they have found the Bible to be true. Now, there are a lot of times where archaeology has um, contradicted the Bible, okay? And a lot of those times, there's a few examples here, the Hittites. The Hittites, archaeologists didn't know who they were, didn't exist in history, wasn't written about it. The only evidence that there was that the Hittites even existed was the Bible. But lo and behold, after studying and looking at where the, the Bible says the Hittites were, hey, guess what? We we found the Hittites. They were they were they were hidden somewhere. They were they were somewhere in there in the in the archaeological finds. Um, there's sometimes where there will be misinterpretations or or uh, or misconceptions. Uh, for example, in the Book of Luke, there's uh, there's this guy named Quirinius, and it says that in um, when Jesus was born, this guy created a census, um, but archaeology or, or archaeology 
has studied it and they said, hey, uh, you you guys know that, you know, when you said Jesus was born and this guy who was there, he wasn't actually the governor at that time. He was the governor later on in a different time period, in a few years afterwards. So, you know what? Your Bible is wrong. Everything is wrong. And then they found out, hey, actually, you know what? The guy who was, yeah, he was there, but he actually served two terms. So he served the first, so he actually was the governor at that time, but also the governor at this time. So the, gov- and the same thing, governor of Syria, the date of the gospel of John, this was, this was an interesting one. So they, they were saying that the, that the date of the gospel of John um, couldn't have been written within a few years of, 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 uh, of Jesus. It had to have been written after the fact. It had to have been written uh, a few hundred years after, and that couldn't have been John because John would have been dead by then. And it was just, 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 this was just added. And you, you can't prove that the book of John was, um, was written in a specific time. And then this guy was sorting through some old papyrus in a, in a catalog of old little papyrus, and he recognized it, and he's like, wait a minute. This is the book of John. And he studied it, and it dates back to the time when he would have been alive. And so even though they archaeologically had proved that, no, John couldn't have written during this time, they found pieces of evidence that show, hey, wait a minute, this was written at this time. And so archaeology has always found uh, that the Bible has been accurate. There's, There's no claim, at least until this point, that has been found. That was weird. It has been found that rejects or contradicts what the Bible says. Now, there's a lot of things they haven't found. Okay. There's a lot of uh, cities, the old city of Ai. Uh, you guys know Jericho, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. There's another city right after that they conquered called Ai. Never existed. Just because they haven't found it doesn't mean it didn't exist, right? And so guess what? Guess what they found? The city of Ai, right? So there's a lot of things that they would, um, this guy is an arche- uh, a Jewish archaeologist. He says this, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And by the same token, proper evaluation of biblical descriptions has often led to amazing discoveries. So now, archaeologists, instead of trying to find contradictions to the Bible, now guess what they're using as their guide to go dig? The Bible. They're like, hey, uh, so the Bible says this and this and this happened. Let's go dig there and let's go try to find it. And guess what they find? They find the thing, right? And it's amazing to think how, how many things God has preserved in order just, just to like wow us, to, to, to help us to, to realize that, he's, that he actually did these things. Uh, there's other extra biblical attestations. Uh, there's over 39 sources that attest to more than 100 facts regarding the lives and the teachings of Jesus. Now, here's what many people would say. Many of the extra biblical sources, so sources not inside the Bible that point to Jesus, they would say, oh, yeah, maybe they're not in the Bible, but these are Christians. They, they have, they're biased, right? They're Christians, so they're going to talk about Jesus, and they're going to prove that he was a real person. But let's look at some of the non-Christian ones, because the apostolic fathers, um, who, who are like the... Um, the apostles and their disciples, the people who followed them, uh, all wrote about Jesus. They all wrote about John. They all wrote about all these stuff, okay? Uh, but let's just say that we're going to dismiss them, even though their testimony is just as valid, as, if, if not more valid than any of the other things. Uh, it, this, this says here, besides all the apostolic fathers whose witness cannot be dismissed simply because they believe in Jesus was the Messiah, are the Jewish and Roman historians. So let's look at a few of them, okay? Let's look at Josephus. It says, now about, there was about this time, Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. So mind you, that alone, he never says he never did any wonderful work. It says he did wonderful works. He says, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many Jews and many of the Gentiles. Now, the reason why this is in brackets is because many people believe that this was actually added to Josephus's writing after the fact. Remember, this is ancient uh, writings. And remember, the Bible is the most 
well-preserved history. Josephus' wasn't, all right? That, remember that all these documents are old, and so it's hard to, to, keep, to keep track of, uh, of what actually was there. But most people believe that Josephus said everything that's not in the brackets, okay? So they believe that the things in the brackets w- were added. Uh, so it says, he was the Christ. It says, when, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him. And then brackets again, for he appeared to them alive again the third day as the divine prophets had foretold these and the 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. Then this is what they think he said, the rest of it. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. So let's just take, for example, out that part that we think is added. What will we still have? Jesus was a real historical figure. Jesus was a man. He lived. He existed, right? We can see that from here. We see that he did wonderful works. We see that Jesus had miraculous things, deeds that he did, right? We see that he uh, drew many people to him, Jews and Gentiles. That's part of what the Bible attests to. And then it, it, it states that Pilate was one of the people who condemned him to the cross. We see that he was crucified, right? Those that loved him at first did not forsake him. And then later on, um, the part that's not in, in brackets says, and the tribal Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. So we see a lot of things just from this. The fact Jesus was real, the fact he was crucified, the fact that he did miracles, a lot of things there. Let's look at another one. Uh, Pliny the Younger, okay, this was the nephew of Pliny the Older, and he wrote different letters between himself and the emperor of Bithynia. Okay, and if, if this goes a little over your head, guys, it, I'm sorry, but I just, I kind of want to give you some evidence so that you see it. If not, just, hey, there's a lot of old people who say a lot of things about Jesus that were true, all right? So there were in, they were in a habit, talking about Christians, of meeting on a certain fixed day before it was light, when they sang an anthem to Christ as God. He didn't say Christ is God, but he inferred based on what he saw, they, it looked like they were praising Christ as if he was God, okay? This talks about the deity of Christ as well. Many people think the deity of Christ was added much later, that Christ was just a man and he was deified hundreds of years later. That's not true. Um, Look at the date of this, by the way, 112 AD. Um, It says, and bound themselves by a solemn oath not to commit any wicked deeds, but to abstain from all fraud, theft, and adultery, never to break their word or deny trust when called upon to honor it. After which it was their custom to separate and then meet again to partake of food, but ordinary innocent kind. So it's like, these guys weren't crazy, but... uh, you know, but they met together and listened to all the stuff they did. This attests to a lot of what we see in the book of Acts. You know, the people gathering together, they met in their homes, they met in public, and they did good deeds. They lived for Christ. Look at what uh, Suetonius, uh, he's a Roman historian, says. It says, since the Jews constantly made disturbance at the uh, at the instigation of Christus, a, a, a mispronunciation, uh, a mistranslation of the word Christ, he expelled them from Rome. We see this, we actually studied this in our passage in Acts where the Jews were expelled from Rome because it was, there, was, uh, um, there was tension between the Christians and the Jews. And so this is confirmed, extra-biblical sources. Look what this guy says. Consequently, talking about Nero, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most ex- exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace Christus, from whose name had his origin, suffered at the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of the pro- procurator Pontius Pilate, Pilatus, and a deadly superstition thus checked for a moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but also in the city. So here we have historians, not Christian, not people who believed in Jesus, not people who had any, uh, anything to gain, talking about Jesus as if he was a real, physical, historical person. So we see that there is proof that Jesus was indeed a a, a, a living person. He wasn't a made-up person, right? Now, here's another interesting one. This one I I find really cool. Uh, So we actually don't have the writings of this guy, Thallus, right? But uh, they were destroyed. But this guy, Julius Africanus, quotes this guy, Thallus, uh, and look at what he says. You guys remember when Jesus died on the cross? There was a huge earthquake. 
and the sky darkened, and it doesn't say why. Many people think, oh, if that were true, this miracle, miraculous thing, earthquakes and, ecl- and, and, and the blocking out of the sun happened, that it must have been written somewhere, right? Look at this. It says, on the whole world, there pressed a most fearful darkness, and the rocks were rent by an earthquake. And many places in Judea and other districts were thrown down. This darkness, Thallus, in the third book of his, of his history, calls, as appears to me without reason, an eclipse of the sun. He didn't understand it. It, it looks like everything was darkened, so it, it looks like it was an eclipse. And so we see historical evidence that there was actually the darkness in that day. So there is so much archaeological, historical evidence that this book is true, right? Uh, then we see survival in a hostile environment. And this is, this, is, this is important also to look at. So you guys know about the Holocaust, right? Do you guys know that there are people who state that the Holocaust didn't exist? Now, why can they not say that lie? That were, that were there. There's people who are still alive, right? Who were part of that. And you can't deny the fact that it happened. Why? Because the people were still alive today. Yeah, there's, there's, there's physical evidence. But 100 years from now, 200 years from now, could historians change the fact that, hey, it didn't happen? And so what the Jews are doing is they are recording the history. They're writing down as much history as they can so that they can preserve the facts that this was a real thing. It's the same thing with the Bible. And what I mean by that is if this was not real, if they were making all this stuff up, the people who were alive in that day would have said, hey, you guys are making all this stuff up. He didn't really die. He didn't really resurrect. And yet you see in in, uh, 1 Corinthians uh, it's not in this passage, but uh, I, I believe it's 1 Corinthians 15. Let me uh, go to the passage. I read this the other day at church. Yeah, uh, this is actually the the 1 Corinthians was probably the first writing in all of the New Testament. 1 Corinthians was probably the first letter written uh, to any any uh, city. And so it's it's probably the earliest thing only within a few years of Jesus, okay? Talking 10, 15 years from Jesus. And he says this, uh, 15.3, says, for what I received, I pass on to you as this first importance, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day. This is the gospel, right? Jesus came, he lived, he died, he resurrected, right? And then he says, look at what he says, that he was raised on the third day, according to scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, and then to the 12. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. In other words, he's saying, hey, you want to prove that the resurrection is real? Ask the 500 people who saw him. Ask these people who are still alive. Go interview them. They'll tell you they saw him. He was real. And does anybody reject what Paul says? No, because it was real. They lived it. They actually saw the resurrection of Christ. And so that couldn't be contradicted. You could say that they had mass hallucinations or whatever, but psychologically, that's unfounded. Um, I'm going to talk about this later, but this, uh, this book actually goes through a lot of details of um, re- specifically the resurrection. Um, we'll get to that in a second, but that's, that's one of the evidences that he sees there. All right. So even in the midst of this hostile environment, we see that the gospel is still true. All right, let's move on because we got we to gotta finish this quick. Prophetic element. So there's a challenge. There's no other book that does this, but look at Isaiah 41. Look at Isaiah 41. I love this because, well, actually, look at 46 first, 9 through 10. Isaiah 46, 9 through 10 says, Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God. There is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning from ancient times, what is still to come, I say my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. So God is saying, hey, I'm the only God. I'm the only one who could foretell the future. I'm the only one who could predict what's going to happen, right? And then I love this because he calls other, <laughs> other gods out and other religions out. 
uh, 41. Look at verse 21 through 24. It says, present your case, says the Lord. Set forth your argument, says Jacob's king. Tell us, you idols, what's going to happen. Tell us what the former things were so that we may consider them and know their final outcome or declare to us the things to come. Tell us what the future holds so that we may know that you are gods. Do something, whether good or bad, so that we will be dismayed and filled with fear. But you are less than nothing. Your works are utterly worthless. Whoever chooses you is detestable. So this is a call out from God to any other gods, any other person who can think they can predict the future and say, he is the only one who can predict the, past, the, the future from the past. And so we won't get into this, but I, I, there's a whole bunch of different passages here of, uh, this is what you were saying, CJ, of how Jesus, prophes- the prophecies of Jesus, there's so of them. There's, there's so many of them, sorry, the mic went out. There's so many of them that it's, it's crazy to think about. So some of them, the seed of the woman, okay, that was predicted in Genesis. Back in Genesis, like, come on, descendants of Abraham, heir of the throne of David, born in Bethlehem, born to be, to be born of a virgin. That's like, that one's really miraculous. That's, that's unthinkable. Flight to Egypt, that he had to leave to Egypt. Triumphal entry in Jerusalem in a donkey. That one's very specific. Uh, betrayed by a friend by 30 pieces of silver. Hatred without reason. Crucified. Time of his death specifically stated. Preceded by a forerunner declared the son of God, a Galilean ministry, speaks in parables, a prophet, priest after the order of Melchizedek, to blind up the brokenhearted, to bind up the brokenhearted, rejected by his own people, the Jews, not believed. These are all prophecies about Jesus and every single one is fulfilled by Jesus. All right. Um, I'm going to give this one to you for homework, but if you read Isaiah 53 you would think you're reading a New Testament passage. I'll read to you the first couple of lines. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root with dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. Um, Look at verse four. He, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Uh, look at what it says, verse seven. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and a sheep before his shears is silent. He did not open his mouth. Uh, go to verse um, nine, he was assigned a grave with the wicked, okay, that we're talking about being uh, crucified with the, with, the, with the thieves, and with the rich in his death. That means he was buried in the tomb of a rich man, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. Like you read this passage and you think you're reading a New Testament passage, right? You think, oh, no, this was written after Jesus, just to describe, just to kind of make it seem good, right? But you look at this. This you, you look at the time this was written. It was written seven hundred years before Christ. Like how how good of a description of the crucifixion of Christ is that? And yet it was written seven hundred years before Christ. And if you you know some people say, okay, you know what? It was written after the fact. They added to the book of Isaiah. But you know what? They found the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found one hundred and fifty years before Christ, and they said the same exact thing. Same exact thing. All the prophecies confirmed. And so we see that this is actually before Christ. Next, this one's huge. And we're going to go a little bit over today. I hope you don't mind. Just we're almost done. Okay. So the testimony of Christ. So if you can prove the resurrection, if the resurrection is true, then everything else in Christianity falls into order. Okay. What do I mean by that? Okay. If you can prove that Jesus was a real person, and he lived in this earth, if you can prove that he died, okay, like actually died, not fake died, like he actually died. And if you can prove that he resurrected, then everything else in the Bible falls in place. Why? Because if he resurrects, he truly is the son of God. He is who he says he is. So that means everything else he says is true. And what does Jesus do? Jesus confirms the Old Testament. Jesus talks about the coming of the day of the Lord. So every single thing in the Bible lines up 
if you can prove that Jesus was the Son of God. So if you can prove the resurrection, then you prove that the Bible is real. So look at what it says here. It says the historical evidence conclusively demonstrates that Christ rose from the grave. The resurrection itself verifies his claims to be the Son of God. Since Christ is God's son, his testimony concerning the inspiration of scripture, because he says that this is the word of God, is final and authoritative. He witnessed the Old Testament's inspiration many times and paved the way for inspiration of the New Testament. Though the appointing and sending of his apostles, I'm sorry, through the appointing of sending of his apostles, validating them through signs and... This is a book that, um, that I was talking about, the... His, this, this is written by an atheist. The guy, his name is Lee Strobel. And um, he set out to do an investigative journaling as to why the resurrection is not real. And he, interviews a, <clears throat> he interviews a whole bunch of people. And after his interviews, after he sits down with all these people, he realizes, hey, there is so much evidence that the resurrection is real that you have to have much more faith to disbelief in the resurrection than to believe. And that's true. I mean, you, ha you have to have faith to believe in the Bible, but you also have, to have faith to not believe in the Bible. You have to believe that all this is false. You have to do away with all the witnesses, with all of this proof, with all of this evidence. You have to reject it completely in order for that to be true. And so this is a great book. I recommend it. Uh, it's free on Hoopla. I know I've sh shared you with you guys that, um, but you can buy it too. The life-changing ability. This is key for the lives of the believers. So not only is this book historically accurate, but we see that it's the divine word of God because of the gospel. See, not only do we see all of these things are historically accurate, but we also see that it has the power to transform and change your life. When you apply these things, when you receive Christ as, as your Lord and Savior, your life is transformed. You see who you were beforehand, and you see who you are now. You see how God has the ability to change uh, who you were. Look at what it says here. The scriptures demonstrate the characteristics of wisdom, discernment, and conviction that one would expect to find from the testimony of an omniscient creator. The things it says is hard sayings. These are not easy things. It's hard for you to live by these things, but if you live by them, your life will change, and not for the worse, but for the better. You will see growth. You will see a transformation in your life. Convic this conviction has evidence itself in a dynamic life change of millions of people throughout time and demonstrates its divine nature. You have millions of people who can attest to the truth of this, of this word. Why? Because it has changed and transformed their life. I'm one of them. Hopefully you guys are as well. You guys can know that this is real because it has transformed your life. And... Uh, Key verse here is Hebrews 4.12. It says, um, For the word of the Lord is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So it, it not only do you read it, but it reads you. It changes you. It, it, it convicts you. It brings life transformation. And then the last one, we'll finish with this the testimony of the Holy Spirit. The, uh, the scriptures testify to themselves through the subjective testimony of God himself in the mind, in the heart, in the soul of the individual, demonstrated that the message is proclaimed, that the message proclaimed is truly the voice of God. Somebody asks you, how do you know this is the word of God? It, it's good enough to say, because I know it's the word of God. His children know that this is the word of God. We can accept it. We can, we can identify ourselves with it. We have seen proof of it in our lives. We have seen God talk to us. We have uh, experienced times where things are too much of a coincidence, right? Like when you're praying for something specific and somebody says something about that and then you read something in the Bible and that same thing shows up and then somebody talks to you about it. It's like coincidence does not happen. We see the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of the believers. Look at John 10, last verse. John 10, 26 says this. But you, but you do not believe me because you are not my sheep. My sheep, those who are his children, says, listen to my voice. I know them 
and they will follow me. His sheep know his voice. We hear it. We see it. We see the life change in us. The testimony of the Holy Spirit, the fact that we can have a relationship with God is the last, well, at least in this one, um, evidence that the Bible is the inspired word of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is not just man's interpretation of things. This is not a history book. This is not uh, a list of facts and, and, and customs and, 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 um, and just things that they made up. We see that this is the inspired word of God. We see it because it says it is. We see it because history proves it is. We see it because nobody in their right minds would ever make this up. We see it because Historically, archaeologically, we find evidence. We see internal evidence. We see external evidence. We see the life transformation that it has. We see that the Holy Spirit convicts us that this is the Word of God. This is the inspired Word of God, and we can put our trust in it. I'm going to give you just a, a final example of just different religious books. I, I have two, but you could do this to any other uh, religious book and compare them. Uh, if you look at the authors of the Bible, there's over 40 authors in the Bible. Uh, just for argument's sake, let's compare the Book of Mormon and the Quran. Both of those were written by one author, one person. Uh, the time that it took to write the book is over 1,500 years. Uh, the Book of Mormon was written in less than 50 years. The Quran was written, again, less than 50 years. Uh, the place, it took place over three continents, right? Different languages, three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek, three different languages. Uh, the Book of Mormon was one place, one language. The Book of uh, the Quran was written one place, one language. Um, honesty, no, all, all these other books aren't honest. They they embellish. They give um, they give uh, extravagant. They they make themselves look good, right? There's there's not all these extra details. It's written to to prove something to you. It's not um, it's not honest about its characters. They're all portrayed in this great light. John Smith was an amazing man. He never did anything wrong. Like. Um, irrelevant details. No, they all have only relevant details. Uh, testable, extraordinary claims. This doesn't mean that they don't have extraordinary claims. They, they talk a lot about miracles and things like that, but none of them could be proven. Why? Because they all happen in these like obscure places that nobody could prove and nobody could attest to. And they're, you can't, you can't, uh, figure it out historically. All right. These were all hidden miracles that they did. Uh, supposed to say testable prophecy. Uh, prophecy that, you know, foretold, like, this happened before, then a period of time, and then this happened. I mean, look at, the, look at the Old Testament. I mean, sometimes we think, okay, Old Testament predicts the New Testament. But if you look at the Old Testament, it predicts uh, historical events. It predicts the fall of Babylon. It predicts the fall of Assyria. It predicts the, 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 the fall of all these different nations. And then it happened. You know, like it predicts these, and it happened exactly as the Bible said. It predicts the coming of the Greeks. It predicts the coming of the Romans. It predicts all these different things. And then you see it historically happening. All right. No other book has that uh, prophecy that's actually fulfilled. They have prophecy, but it's, it's not testable. Um, lack of motive for fabrication. Um, what was the purpose of making it up? Like they were going to die. That was, that was the purpose. These other guys, yeah, we knew religion or whatever. So the Bible is the only one with that. Does, do the other ones have life-changing ability? Yeah, they might. They can say, hey, this will change your life. The Quran might change your life. I mean, I don't know. Uh, the testimony of the Holy Spirit, it, it tells them, I guess, their, their interpretation of the Holy Spirit tells them that their book is real, right? Or claim for divine inspiration. They all do that. They all claim that they are divinely inspired. But uh, again, None of these other writings have the kind of backing that this has. The historic, the archaeological finds, uh, this is the only one. And so, with that said, these are the nails. This is the, the, the side of Jesus showing you, hey, not only is the Word of God real, He could prove it to you. He could show you. And this is all evidence. And if you needed that evidence, good. Maybe now... You can believe a little bit more. Um, if you already had your faith and you already believed in God, good. Your faith is stronger. Because now you know that your faith isn't just based on fairy tales. 
It's based on actual historical fact that can be proven that God has preserved just for us to be able to do this. Um, any questions? 